I'm Dan Costa, editor-in-chief of PCMag.com. Welcome to Fast Forward, part of an ongoing conversation about living in the future. Very special show for you today. My guest is Dr. Jean Twangy. She's a professor of psychology at San Diego State University, and most recently the author of, and this is a very long book title, <laughs> The author of iGen, Why Today's Super Connected Kids Are Growing Up Less Rebellious, More Tolerant, and Less less Happy, and Completely Unprepared for Adulthood, and What That Means for the Rest of Us. She's also the author of an article in The Atlantic called Have Smartphones Destroyed a Generation, a headline that she did not write, but which <laughs> uh, describes the book, and the, it, developed, it generated exactly as much controversy as the editors wanted it to generate. Um, it's a provocative thesis, but she's got a lot of great data to prove her point. We're going to talk about how technology is affecting this generation in ways that we really didn't anticipate um, before when these when smartphones were first introduced. Um, it's a great talk. Uh, thanks so much for stopping by la the lab to uh, to talk to us. Sure. So the book's coming out this week. Mm -hmm. um, first of all, congratulations on naming yet another generation, <laughs> uh, the iGen generation. Um, I imagine the Simon and Schuster lawyers went back and forth with <laughs> Apple a little bit on this, perhaps. <laughs> Uh, Apple's very protective of that eye. Yeah, well, it is. It's you, know, you can't copyright a little eye. At least that's what I would guess. Not yet. <laughs> so who 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 is, who are this uh, who is this iGen uh, generation? I still call anybody younger than me millennial. Mm -hmm. uh, but there's another generation that snuck in there. That's right. So millennials are born roughly 1980 to around 1994. This new generation, iGen, is born about 1995 to 2012. So at first we thought, you know, millennials would last a little bit longer, but then some trends started showing up in the data and made me think that we have a new generation born around the mid-90s. So, and the reason it's a new generation is because they behave a little differently than the generation before them, and that's how you can sort of put the marker down. What are some of those differences between those two generations? So iGen's the first generation to grow up with the smartphone for their whole adolescence. And that's really had ripple effects across their behavior, their attitudes, their mental health. So as one example, obviously they spend a lot more time online uh, and texting uh, and on social media than um, teens did 10 years before when, the, when it was the millennials who were the teens. So what makes the, the smartphone in particular any different than television or video games? or even radio back in the day, like all these mm -hmm. technologies that were gonna ruin our youth. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, what makes the phone different? Yeah, well, a couple of things. You know, the first thing is the smartphone is kind of with you all the time, especially teens. You've seen them; it's always there, and it can always be with you. And it's small and it's in reach. So I think that's one thing that makes it different. You know, the other thing is I'm often asked about this. Oh, you know, everything is going to be ruined. Well, it's not quite that much. It's just more nuanced than that. And yeah, people said the same thing about TV, but they were sort of right about mm -hmm. TV. So some people have concluded. You look at community groups and so on and. So Sort of some of those breakdowns, that's probably because of TV. So in some ways they were right. Behavior patterns change. Uh, I think the new technologies definitely change behavior patterns. The thing about the phone is that where you use the technology was completely revolutionized. I mean, this yeah. the television was something you, you participated in at home right. uh, during certain hours. There was main time, prime time TV. The phone breaks down all those barriers. Yeah both from a time perspective and a location perspective. Yeah, so that probably has something to do with why um, teens and adults use it so much. So you know, teens uh, are using their phones six to eight hours a day on average. Adults are probably not that far behind them, a lot of us. Um, and you're right, you're not doing it just at home. It's everywhere and it's all the time. I mean, including at night. That was another thing I found out in talking to teens is how many of them slept with their phones or at least had their phones in arm reach sometimes with it on all night. The, uh, before we go on, I want to make sure people from the audience, if you're watching on Facebook Live, you can ask us questions in the comments section. We'll try and get to those on camera. If you're listening on a podcast at a later date, obviously we cannot answer your questions live because that's not how the internet works. Um, so my son is 23 years old. He's gainfully employed. Um, thank God. How, <laughs> how is, uh, t talk to me about the average, the, a day in the life of an iGen teenager. Yeah. So there was that First, we can start with that time, that six to eight hours of you know, time on the phone, online, and social media. And what that means is, and that's just in leisure time, so that means there's not a whole lot of time left for a lot of other things that teens used to do. So getting together with your friends or going to parties or going to a mall with your friends, iGen teens do that a lot less than teens did just five years ago or ten years ago. Uh, really stark pattern where they just kind of fell off a cliff. 
in terms of the number of uh, times they go out without their parents and, and get together. So that in-person social interaction is falling by the wayside more and more as the communication moves to the phone. So that's one of the biggest changes. You know, a lot of other things about how teens spend their time hasn't changed a whole lot. Many people ask me, oh, maybe they're not getting together with their friends because they're doing more hours of homework. They're doing actually a little fewer hours of homework than teens were in the 80s and the 90s, and it really hasn't changed a whole lot in the last five to 10 years. Same thing with extracurriculars. There's a perception that there's a lot more time spent on that. That's also stayed about the same. It's very interesting because you, in your research, you find all these different correlations um, saying that you know the iGen generation, they literally just don't go out of the house as much as previous generations. That's right. They're not even getting their driver's licenses as early as older generations because there's a, there's a lack of independence that's manifesting mm -hmm. itself. Yeah, so this is part of a trend that was accelerated by smartphones but started with millennials and has really deeper cultural roots. So this is the trend toward teens growing up more slowly, taking on both the pleasures and the responsibilities of adulthood later than they used to. So things like driving, a lot of them are not getting their driver's license even by end of senior year of high school. Um, going out on dates, going out without their parents, um, having a paid job, drinking alcohol, having sex during high school. iGen teens do those things less than teens used to. It was very interesting reading your article, uh, and I'll quote from it here, it said the average teen now has sex for the first time in the spring of 11th grade, mm -hmm. a full year later than the average Gen Xer. Mm -hmm. It seems counterintuitive, so mm -hmm. it, we always thought that that age was getting younger and younger, mm -hmm. and now the trend is going back the other way. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Yeah, because it did, from boomers to Gen Xers, so I'm a Gen Xer, we kind of started adolescence a little earlier than the boomers did, and then we extended it as long as we possibly could. Mm -hmm. So with this generation, with iGen, they are kind of extending childhood into adolescence. So so that comes up in ways like uh, having sex and drinking alcohol where many people, especially parents, would be like, isn't that a good thing? And I would say, of course, mm. yes, that's a wonderful thing. But it's a trade-off because they're also, you know, with not going out of the house as much, not driving, not having a job, they're also not having as many experiences with independence. And then when they get to college or get a job, then sometimes they don't know exactly what to do because they just haven't had as much experience making decisions on their own. So all, let's assume that these are, all these uh, patterns are in place. Why is this a, 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 is this a, how do you know this is a causal relationship with phones and technology and not just, you know, a factor of changing cultural norms? Yeah. So we can walk through a little bit of the, of I, you know, how I came to that conclusion. So um, first, if you look at uh, teens in these big national surveys, those who spend more time on screens, um, it's correlated with them being less happy, um, more depressed and even having more risk factors for suicide. But that's correlation, not causation. So you always have to think, well, maybe it's the teens who are unhappy and depressed who then use social media more, for example. But there's three studies that have looked at that really carefully that more or less ruled out that explanation. They followed people over time and found the more people were using social media, the number of hours, then that correlated with, sorry, that, that meant later they were less happy. But if they were less happy, that didn't mean they used social media more. Mm -hmm. So it suggests the causation does go more from social media to unhappiness. Then there was another study that um, randomly assigned people to give up Facebook for a week and then, or not, and then looked at the end, uh, you know, how they felt. And those who gave up Facebook ended the week happier, less lonely, and less depressed. And that was a true experiment. So after that's, just one week of After separation. one week, that's what, that's what that study found. And that wasn't, you know, that was something that um, some folks did in Denmark. And it was an interesting um, way to really kind of nail down we had a flip of a coin that you ended up in this group, so we know it's not outside factors, we know it's not that reverse causation. So what do you think it is about social media, and I, and I think we could probably, we could maybe separate the phone experience itself from social media, but they're pretty they're, Yeah, they're pretty intermingled. I mean, what is it about the experience that is inherently depressing? Is it, is it fear of missing out? Is it constant distraction? Is it 24-7 um, peer group interactions? Yeah, you know, I think a lot of it is if it's used in moderation, an hour a day, two hours a day, there actually aren't any negative effects for mental health. It's at two hours a day, three, four, five, and beyond where you see the effects showing up. So I think that's, it, it suggests that it, it's only partially the phone and social media per se, it's what it's crowding out when you're spending that much time on it. That if you're spending so much time on that, maybe you're not exercising, maybe you're not seeing your friends in person as much. And those two things, exercising, spending time with friends in person, study after study after study, shows those are linked to better mental health. So 
it's only partially some of the pressures around the phone and waiting for likes and that type of thing. It's also what you're not doing because you're on the phone. Because it's crowding out those other yeah. more healthy experiences. Exactly. Um, the, the numbers, uh, I, I really, until I read your article, I really hadn't been paying attention to the suicide rate yeah. uh, among children of these ages. Yeah. Um, but you write that it, um, it was three, to three times as many 12 to 14 year old girls killed themselves in 2015 as in 2007. Yes. Uh, and it's an even wider gap for girls than it is for boys. Right. Can you talk a little bit about, about why that is? Yeah. So um, in one study, we were able to look at uh, the time teens spent on electronic devices, which includes phones, uh, and then what percentage of them had a suicide risk factor. So being sad or hopeless for two weeks, um, thinking about suicide, making a suicide plan, even attempting suicide. And there was a pretty big difference between those who spent, say, an hour a day on electronic devices, those who spent five hours or more in terms of how many had a suicide risk factor. Those who you know, spent a lot more time had much more risk. Girls spend more time on social media. Um, they'd spend about an equal amount of time on phones, but social media seems to have its own unique challenges with depression and uh, with just some of the cyberbullying and some of the pressures there that were always there for girls and now become really acute when they can be bullied, you know, all the time, when they're on vacation, you know, at night, even, a, you know, away from school. Um, so that might be one of the reasons why the suicide rate um, for girls has gone up at an even steeper pace than it has for boys. It does seem like, you know, anecdotally, the, the worst cases of cyberbullying over the last couple of years, especially among young girls, mm -hmm. um, happens among girls, and, 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 and part of it is because they're, this, the bullying continues long after school, yeah. and it can work on it. Go, it can, can occur on the weekend, That's and it right. can be. It's very public in a way that you know yes. bullying that used to be the size of the crowd in the room. Right. And when it's on social media, it's everybody in high school or yeah. everybody in, in middle school that can see. Yeah. Um, it just has this amplification effect that um, seems like it could be pretty powerful. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's 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 really it's really devastating what's what's happened to some of these girls. Um, and girls have always bullied that, them, each mm -hmm. other that way, more verbally, more socially than boys. Um, and there is a bigger link between um, cyberbullying and suicide risk factors than regular bullying. Both of them are obviously very bad and increase the risk by two or three times, but the risk is, is heightened with cyberbullying. You also write a little bit about, about sleep and the effect of mm -hmm. technology on sleep. Yeah. Um, I'm the kind of person that tends to fall asleep on the couch watching TV. Mm -hmm. uh, I realize it's probably not the healthiest way to do it. But <laughs> no, it's not. <laughs> it's um, more. It's even worse with uh, for these kids that are that are that have their phones on their bedstands. Yeah, and sure enough, uh, since 2010, the percentage of teens who get seven or hour seven or more hours of sleep a night has has uh, gone down. Mm -hmm. So teens are getting less sleep, and those who spend more time on screens get less sleep. Um, and there's all kinds of physiological things involved too with TV and with phones. It's the blue light, then your body doesn't produce enough melatonin to get you to calm down, realize it's nighttime to go to sleep, plus then there's all the emotional you know, stimulation of being on the phone that isn't quite as much there for TV. So, um, and teens tell me, and young adults do too, that their phone's the last thing that they see before they go to sleep at night and the first thing they see in the morning. Well, the first thing they see in the morning, that's okay. But doing that right before bed is just not a recipe for healthy sleep. And what is it about, um, it sounds like most of what we've talked about uh, today could also be true of adults with technology yeah. as well. Yeah. Do you see a separate, is it the same, do, do, is the, the consequence of the technology the same for adults as it is for children, or what would make it different? Yeah, so the, the data that I draw from is because it's a captive audience. We have a lot more data on teens and young adults. Um, so I, there's, there's some of those studies I described about social media and unhappiness have been done on adults, and they find mm. the same effects. So I would suspect a lot of these trends are also going to start showing up among adults. Um, but I think with teens, it's especially worrisome because that's a really crucial time for emotional development for um, socialization and learning social skills. So I, I think it's um, a time that is just so crucial for who you are and learning who you are through hanging out with your friends. And teens are doing that a lot less. They're communicating through the phone. And some people say, well, that's fine because then they're still communicating with their friends the way mm -hmm. kids have always done. But that assumes that that electronic communication is the same as face-to-face -face communication, that it's the same for mental health, that it's the same for <coughs> developing social skills. And it's pretty clear it's not the same. It's just not. What do you think of the counter-argument that 
Um, these phones and these technologies are, are augmenting our intelligence, increasing mm -hmm. our, the size of our social networks, mm -hmm. um, providing a, a support structure that may not have been there mm -hmm. before, um, and, uh, and allows people to connect on a better level. I mean, yeah. there, there's got to be some upside to these new technologies as well, doesn't there? Oh, absolutely. And I, I don't even see that necessarily as a counter argument. Mm -hmm. um, I think that points toward moderation, as I was mentioning, because, yeah, smartphones are awesome. They can. Mm -hmm figure out, help us figure out where to go. They can give us information at our fingertips. Um, if you're, say, someone who um, wants to reach out to people who have a unique interest that maybe you have and that other people around you don't, you can do that. So there's some wonderful things that you can do. But it shouldn't be seen as a replacement for the rest of social life. And you shouldn't see, for as sometimes happens, two teens sitting next to each other, not talking to each other, mm -hmm. but texting each other when they're sitting right next to each other. Um, I've seen some marriages that work that way too. Um, the, uh, so what are parents supposed to do when they see their teens, they're sitting at the table and they see this happening. Yeah. I mean, it's in a, the, ta the kitchen table is almost this ideal environment in which you have the most control over yeah. your children. Yeah. But most, in a lot of homes, A, that meal doesn't happen. Mm -hmm. And then there's the rest of the day where that you have very little control over what your kids are doing. What are, what are parents supposed to do? Yeah. Well, so if you have kids who are, say, elementary school, early middle school, and they don't have a phone yet, put off getting them a phone for as long as you can uh, until they're more emotionally ready to handle it. Some of the effects on mental health show up uh, much more among younger teens than older ones. Um, and then once they have that smartphone, there's apps that you can put on it to limit the amount of time your teen spends on it. So you can choose whatever you think is right. It might be different from one kid to another. Um, but you know, the average, you know, given the effects, um, for mental health, I'd put it maybe at 90 minutes, something 90 minutes like that. A day 90 of, minutes of a phone day. Access. Yeah. So mm -hmm. that pretty much eliminates the phone as like a as a library resource, or I, uh, no? Well, then you can use a desktop. Mm -hmm. You need to do your homework. Use a desktop. Oh, that's interesting. So or a laptop. It, so the um, and it is. I mean, you think it's really the phone itself, not necessarily the connectivity. Um, it's not the internet connection. It's the form factor and the portability and. Well, it's hard to tell. With the data that I've been analyzing, it's, it seems to be more just the total amount of time spent on screens. That seems to be the biggest risk factor. However, that's the total amount of time spent on screens during leisure time. So that would mean if there's homework and so on, and you know, that homework is actually being done rather than you know, watching YouTube, mm -hmm. then you know, that's not what we're talking about. We're talking about for entertainment during leisure time, not necessarily for you know, researching a project. Is there a responsibility on the part of technology vendors and social media networks to sort of factor in these, these issues? Because Facebook's job is to get you to spend more time on Facebook and, okay. and, and interact more. Instagram's job is to, is to increase the amount of time you spend on the surface. These are businesses that are designed right. to be as addictive as possible. Right. Um, what, are, what are their responsibility in servicing you know, this, this, this younger generation. Yeah, and I think, I, I'm glad you brought that up because I think that's one thing that, you know, parents and teens need to keep in mind, that these are businesses that they have an interest in, you know, people spending six to eight hours. That sounds good to them. Um, they but, brag about it in their quarterly reports. Right, and I, I understand why. You know, it's business. That's what makes some money. Um, and, you know, as to... Should, I mean, because people have asked me this, you know, should we have regulations? I always say that's kind of above my pay grade. Um, I think that's something we need to have a conversation about and try to figure out. Um, I can say that I think for some of these platforms, they'd have happier customers if they were, yes, absolutely, using their platform, but just maybe not for so many hours a day. What do you think of, uh, we're about to enter into a world where not only do we have screens available to us 24-7, but we're going to have virtual worlds available to us. Um, there's been a lot of science fiction written about this, about will people get lost in these virtual, re in these virtual worlds. What is your research, what's your hunch given the research mm -hmm. that you've done? How are we going to handle a, a virtual reality and augmented reality? Yeah, you know, I think it might just depend on how the technology evolves. Because if it's the way it is now, where you're kind of alone in this own world, it may be just as isolating or more than being on the phone. You know, if it ends up being something where there's touch and you can interact with other people, um, it's funny because on the one hand you can say, well, that you know, how cool would that be to you know give your your friend who's you know 2,000 miles away a hug, you know, and that sounds great. But then if we're living our lives completely online, it, it, it then it crosses the line into the science fiction where then people start to say, well, that sounds really scary mm -hmm. to just be living virtually. That that 
may not be the best idea. So it'll be interesting to see what comes next. I think there's, there's an interesting context, too, that your book deals with very squarely, which is that this is a new generation that has never not known this technology. Yeah. So we tend to think of these technologies as being additive to our human experience, and we to our lives, sometimes healthily, sometimes unhealthily, but they're additive. Mm -hmm. At a certain age, this could be replacing other interactions for kids at a certain age, and that may be where the psychological <coughs> issues start to creep in. I think it already is yeah. replacing those other interactions for iGen. Um, What's interesting, though, is when I talk to iGen teens and one, one in-depth survey and then the uh, interviews that I did to kind of augment the, the big um, national surveys, I asked them in this one uh, question, you know, would you rather interact with someone through social media and texting or would you rather see them face-to-face? -face? Almost all of them said they'd rather see somebody face-to-face. Because that's the thing, you know, you can change the technology, you can even change the amount of time that people spend on it, especially iGen, but you can't change basic human evolution that we evolved mm -hmm. to interact face to face and that that is still the most emotionally fulfilling and that the, it's the best for mental health. And possibly necessary for a healthy and happy life. Yes, I think that's clear, yeah. Let me get to my closing questions. What uh, technological trend concerns you the most? Is there anything that keeps you up at night other than your iPhone? <laughs> well, I try not to use the iPhone at yeah. night um, and keep it out of, keep it out of the room. Um, I think the trend toward just having that phone in your hand all the time, I think if I had to like pinpoint one thing, it's not just that teens are using that phone to replace the in-person interaction. It's that when they do get together in person, they're still on their phones. Mm -hmm. So that it's that everything is on the phone and they're just not present for their own lives and not looking each other in the eye. One of the people, I, I, teens I interviewed, a 13-year-old told me that in, in her middle school, they, she had a teacher who said, put your phone in the box, we're learning to look each other in the eye. And that that had to be taught mm -hmm. was interesting. Yeah, a total yeah. new world. Yeah. Um, is there a service, an app, or a device that you use every day that you just feel has transformed your life that you're incredibly impressed by? Um, probably Apple Maps. I just went on a long road trip and mm -hmm would have been tough without it. Okay, so <laughs> you're not, a, not opposed to augmented reality, but still maintain, live in the real world. You know, I think all these things, the smartphone and the apps, they're tools. So we need to use them instead of them using us. Mm -hmm. And uh, how can people follow what you're doing? I know the book is going to be coming out in just a couple of days. We'll have yep. a link to it in the comment section. Yep. Uh, we'll have a link uh, on the website too. Uh, yep. How can people follow what you're doing? Yep. Um, so I'm on Twitter, Gene underscore Twangy, um, and also uh, my website, which will be updated any day now, mm -hmm. GeneTwangy.com. I have lots of stuff about the books and all the other writing I do. Very good. Thanks yep. so much for coming by the lab today and talking to me. Thank you. I appreciate it. That is Fast Forward for today. I want to thank you for joining us. If you want to get back episodes of this show, you can go on PCMag.com. You can also find it on Apple Podcasts, on Google Play, and everywhere else fine podcasts are given away for free. Thanks so much for joining us today. I'll see you in the future.